All right. Good morning. Start with a question. How many of you have been sick in the last year? Probably a good portion of us. How many of you have been really, really sick in the last year? It might be a few of us, right? Yeah. Um, I was, was thinking about where to go next. And you know that my uh, uh, normal mode of operation is I like to pick a book and just work through a book. Uh, but you've noticed over the last uh, several weeks, I've been dealing with various topics that have been uh, of interest to us. And that's come from some of my conversations with you. And this idea of sickness, um, I realized that over the last, we've been saying what, over, there's been a lot of people sick in the last several months. And, uh, and it dawned on me, I have never really spent a lot of time on what the Bible says about sickness. And uh, so I want to do that here. And uh, when I got through and I started uh, making notes about the Bible says, once again, this is probably going to be two, maybe even three lessons uh, but I know uh, that now looking at the Bible, and looking more closely, the Bible says a lot more about sickness than I had previously thought. And I know when it comes to sickness, especially really bad, debilitating sicknesses, sometimes we have a lot of questions from that, don't we? Well, we have obviously have questions sometimes for God, right? And sometimes we have questions for our Lord uh, Jesus, the healer. But the question uh, I want to deal with, uh, in addition to those questions, is what should be our attitude in the, in the midst of all of this? And how should we deal with it? What does the Bible say about sickness? What place does that have in God's uh, creation? And so this morning, I just want to spend a few minutes defining what we mean by sickness and then look at its origin in the Bible and then God's solution for it in the Bible. Then we'll move on from there next time. So start with uh, the definition of sickness. What do we mean by sickness? And when you really stop to start thinking about it, there's a lot of things that fall under the umbrella of uh, sickness. So let's narrow down what we mean by that. If you look in the Oxford Dictionary, it simply says, sickness is a state of being sick or ill, the condition of suffering from some malady, illness, or ill health. Then I went to a thesaurus and looked up some synonyms, words that are related to sickness. And those are words like ailment or debilitation or to be impaired in some way or frailty or illness or suffering and infirmity, disease, infection or inflammation. Then I went and looked, and looked at some words of the opposite. Of course, the opposite of sickness is health, right? And along with that is the idea of energy or fitness or strength or a sense of well-being, of vigor, robustness, soundness, stamina, and wholeness. And so many things, many conditions fall under the heading of sickness. Sometimes we talk about infections. Sometimes we talk about diseases, sometimes viruses or a bacterial sort of a, a, a infection or even genetic conditions and disabilities. And I'm looking at these two, the, these two lists here and I wonder, hmm, could the body wearing out be con in old age? Could that be considered kind, kind of fall under, the, the, uh, uh, under this heading as well? There are, there are sicknesses that just seem to naturally come with age. And then in addition to all of that, there are emotional and psychiatric and mental conditions as well that fall under the heading of sickness. And so I tried to find all the sicknesses that are mentioned in the Bible, and I was kind of surprised. And here's just a, just a brief list of some of the things I found. The Bible mentions stomach ailments, insanity, leprosy, plagues, pestilence, blindness, deafness, muteness, atrophy, dysentery, deformities, epilepsy or seizures, uh, fever, hemorrhage, tumors, and worms, and there are more in addition to this. But, to, but when you look at that, you, you, we're reminded that the Bible is no stranger to the whole range of different kinds of sicknesses. And as I'm looking at all of this, I ask myself the question, what do all of these have in common. What do all sicknesses have in common? Simply that something is not working the way it's supposed to. 
uh, what do you do when something is not working the way it's supposed to? You find someone that knows what they're doing to help make whatever is not working to work, right? And so if it's your computer, you call tech support and hopefully somebody's not reading off a script and they know what they're talking about, can help you with whatever problem you have. Or if you have a problem with your vehicle, you go see a mechanic and he'll diagnose your problem, give you a solution, tell you what it'll take to fix it and, um, and fix it for you. And, um, and so uh, we have someone to troubleshoot and diagnose the problem. I don't know if you're aware that in other parts of the world, they deal with sickness and have a completely different view of sickness. Did you know there are many people in the world that will tell you that sickness does not exist? There are many people in the world. The view of the world is that it's all in your head. In fact, they'll go so far to say everything you see is all in your head. All of life is just an illusion. It doesn't really exist, including yourself as an individual. That is just uh, an illusion. All of life is pain, and the goal is to escape this illusion. And you can do this through meditation and prayer. I don't know what you're praying to because they're not praying to, to any particular God. And the goal is through all of this meditation and, and, and prayer and these practices, you receive enlightenment. And what the end, uh, you go, to some, people, some people call it nirvana or someplace like that. And basically all that means is that you cease to exist as an individual individual, and you become absorbed into the eternal oneness and you get off of this treadmill of being reincarnated over and over and over again. And in the meantime, everything you see, you need to escape the illusion of pain, the illusion of disease. The wow, that doesn't seem like a very adequate way to deal with it, does it? Just, just deny, uh, that's denial, does it? Uh, denying that it exists, no, that, that's not a solution. The secular humanist point of view I feel a little bit better. So uh, when you get sick, it's because uh, sicknesses are the result of either mutations or harmful, harmful bacteria, or bacteria or genes or viruses or things of this nature. And so we study under a, a microphone, a micro, microphone, micro, what do you call that thing? Um, microscope, yes. And you try to discover how these things work and you try to fix them. And there's been a many great breakthroughs and successes and dealing with various kinds of conditions and, uh, and diseases. Um, you never hear about anyone having smallpox anymore, right? Um, and so they try to fix all of these things. And a uh, little bit more of a challenge are sometimes are the emotional and mental sicknesses, but there have been great breakthroughs there as well. It wasn't that long ago. People didn't even, didn't even understand those things. You know, how do you deal with uh, depression? How do you deal with uh, when people have violent tendencies uh, and so forth? But as I look at this and look what the Bible says, I realize that the only 100% a uh, solution to all of this comes from God, the creator. We can make great advances, but we will never in and of ourselves by, the, by our own wisdom and by our own power be able to solve our own problems. Because in his word, we learn the origin of sickness and we learn of his solution. And so that brings us to the first point here. Sickness is the result of of sin at the very beginning in the garden. You do realize that when it comes to sickness, I, the Bible doesn't seem to indicate that sickness, many all of these sicknesses that we see, that these were part of God's original creation. In fact, it says when God created his creation of stages, at the end of every day of creation, he saw that it was what? was good. And then when he finally got down to the end and he created mankind, now he sees it's what? Very good. And so that seems to indicate that this was not part of the original creation. It was something that invaded the creation. And I think we see some of that here in Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know 
that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. All right, a couple of points to pull out of this passage here. Number one, suffering is temporary. So that degenerative spine disease, that bone disease, that cancer, heart disease, whatever it is, it may seem to be permanent, but no matter how bad it is, and no matter how incurable it may seem in this life, none of that is permanent. The pastor says all of this stuff is not even worthy to be compared to the glory, to the goodness that is coming when everything will be made right. The second point from this passage, passage is that creation was subjected to futility. Now, what is that futility? What does that word mean? It means vanity. It means emptiness. It means purposelessness. And so creation, this tells us that creation did not start out this way. Every day, creation was good until it was completed. And then it was very good until it was subjected to futility. And number three, the third point we can get through in this passage is that creation is in bondage to corruption. What does it mean to be in bondage? You're stuck, right? There is no way to get out of it unless somebody comes and uh, rescues you. Creation, even though we see creation able to, what do they say? Creation over time kind of heals itself, but not completely. It cannot completely heal itself because it is in bondage to corruption. Now, the text doesn't go into detail what it means by corruption, but what corruption do we see in the created order? We've already um, looked at several of them this morning, right? All of these diseases and sicknesses, whether they're physical, they're mental, or even social illnesses. God did not create the world with this. He created a good world, and all of this is an intrusion. And then finally... Creation will be set free from this bondage. This is not going to be a forever condition. Um, it kind of reminds me of the way we preserve food. How do we preserve food? Most of the times uh, we put it in some place cold, right? In the refrigerator. And unless, what happens when the power goes out? Have you ever had that happen before? The power goes out and you hope it comes back on soon enough. One time we had the power go out for three, was it three days? I don't remember. It was, anyway, it was out for several days. And you know what happens to food in the refrigerator when your power is out for several days? It gets really nasty, doesn't it? And so, uh, yeah. Uh, and and uh, it could be a real mess trying to clean all of that, uh, all of that stuff up. It really goes bad and it's a mess. That kind of illustrates what has happened in our world, how sin has corrupted our world. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they disconnected the power. They disconnected themselves from God and tried to do things their own way rather than following God's instruction. And because of their sin, that sin came into the world and corrupted the world. It corrupted themselves and corrupted the created order. And creation has been in bondage ever since. And so now the creation is in bondage. So the question is, who will set creation free from bondage to corruption? Mankind has been trying from day one. And mankind makes a lot of progress, but it seems like we can't ever seem to solve all of our own problems. Oh, we can do all kinds of things, right? We can harness the power of the atom. Uh, we can uh, look under a microscope and see what's going on in your individual cells. We have all kinds of medication and the list goes on and on. But we still seems like sometimes there's new sicknesses we never heard of that pop up. Right. And sometimes and social ills, they don't seem to go away either. All the social problems we have in our communities, uh, they seem to con continue as well. And so even with all of our effort, we, even as 
even with all of the wisdom we've obtained, the smarts and the, and the knowledge, it seems like uh, we still can't seem to solve our problems. And probably the reason is because we need to understand that the root of all of our problems comes from what? That three-letter word, sin. And the only one that can deal with sin is who? Our Lord. And so that brings us to the last point. God is the one that will make us whole. How does he do that? Look at this passage. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. Uh, sickness is sometimes, depending on a person's translation, is rendered infirmities. He bore our infirmities. Sometimes it's uh, he bore our griefs. He bore our sorrow. So I had to go look up, okay, why does it say sickness over here? And it says griefs over here. And the Hebrew word chala means sickness um, or extreme distress re related to the sickness. So it's talking about not just having a cold, but it's talking about something debilitating. Okay, and so he bore our de debilitating conditions and our sicknesses. He carried all of that on the cross. Not only did he carry our sins, but he carried the consequences of our sins on the cross as well, which is this debilitating sickness. And that's why we are able to have this in the final chapter of the Bible. Here's what is coming because of what he did on the cross. I saw heaven and a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It's perfect. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he also said, write this down, <clears throat> for these words are trustworthy and true. A new world, a renewed world, a world in which there is no more pain, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying. Do you think uh, sicknesses and genetic mutations and all that sorts of things will be included as being no more as well? Since sin and Hades and death are thrown into the lake of fire, all of those things, along with their consequences, have been eradicated. In fact, I think we have that uh, message here and uh, what follows after that. Notice what it says. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the what? Healing of the nations. And so you have the water of life. Okay, this is what gives life. And it's coming from where? It's coming from the throne of God. And God's throne is in the midst of his people. <clears throat> and by the water of life, on either side, you have this tree of life and its leaves are for the healing of the nations in other words there will be no more sickness no more genetic conditions no more deformities none of these things that has come as a result of sin this got me to thinking about something we were talking about this a few days ago uh, superfoods superfoods you ever heard of superfoods before and I know they talk about superfoods. People eat superfoods and they eat supplements because these things are good for your health. I read an article about superfoods and it says that superfoods are, are, aren't a nutritionally recognized category of foods. Okay, They're not a nutritionally recognized category of foods. So there is no specific criteria a food must meet in order to be considered a superfood. But the title is typically reserved for foods that are essentially nutrient dense while generally being low in calories. And it says that superfoods help promote health by increasing your immune fu function and decreasing your chance of disease uh, and decreasing your chance of disease 
prevention or progression. Uh, each superfood has different nutritional properties, but overall they're associated with number one, heart health, a strong immune system, cancer prevention, reduced inflammation, and lower cholesterol. And these articles give a list of superfoods that will keep you healthy and help you live longer. <clears throat> and I'm not going to go into that because that's not my point. My point is that these superfoods, no matter how well you eat, no matter how healthy you are, they cannot do what the tree of life will do. They cannot heal you from all of your illnesses and all of your diseases, and they cannot make you live forever. The tree of life is far for surpasses any of these so-called super foods because it comes from God. <clears throat> this tree is watered by the water of life that comes from the throne of God. And so there is nothing else like it. And the whole point of this image is to show us that when we are, uh, when we are taken from this world and we're given, uh, given a new home in the presence of God, all things, all the maladies that we had, those things will be gone. <clears throat> nothing more than a distant memory. And the whole point of all this is to give us hope. Hope that God will make us whole. Remember that like death, sickness and illness is an intrusion on God's created order. <clears throat> and Jesus came from heaven to earth to undo the devastating effects of sin. Got a lot more to say about sickness, but I'm going to save that for next time. And maybe the time after that, depending on, uh, on how it goes. <clears throat> but for now... Remember that Jesus came from heaven to earth to undo the devastating effects of sin. When he died on the cross for our sin, he died on the cross for our sin to reunite us to God and to undo all of the devastating effects of sin. And perhaps that's why the miracles that he, miracles that he performed, the signs that he performed, were not just pulling a rabbit out of the hat. He could have done something like that. But they were, all of his signs had something to do with the effects of sin. I don't know if you ever noticed that. Everything that he healed came as a result of sin, whether it was being uh, demonized by an unclean spirit or whether uh, it was somebody that was unable to walk or somebody that was sick or even somebody that died. All of that is a result of sin. And so his signs show that he came to undo the effects of sin. And he does that ultimately at the cross and at the resurrection. And if you accept him as your Savior and as your Lord, and you're ready to accept him as your Savior and, and as your Lord. And if you've not done it yet, then you're ready to go down into the water and be baptized. And the Bible says he washes away all of your sin and you accept the gift that he offers to you, the gift of hope and the gift of life. And so that when he returns, you'll go to heaven and the new Jerusalem to be with the Father for eternity. And if you've already done that, then remember this. As you, as you, I guess I can say this, as you weaken... Anybody with age and time, can you relate to that? As you weaken with age and time, remember, it's not always going to be like that. If you're dealing with a debilitating sickness, remember that it's not always going to be like that. God has a solution. And when Jesus returns, everything will be made right. So don't lose hope. That is part of the hope that... Uh, God has laid down for us. We're going to go ahead and sing a song now. So think about these things. Be encouraged. Be instructed. And if you still have, uh, if you still need to obey the gospel and accept Jesus as Lord and go down to the water, be baptized. The baptistry is back there. Talk to one of us today if you still need to do that. In the meantime, let's go ahead and sing uh, the next song and, and be encouraged.